Shut up and sit down. And welcome to the week three edition of the Black Swarm Podcast. Hank Piper here with Rob Antonell, as always, doing it a little bit different this week. Our first Zoom call type deal, so uh, bear with us as we try and figure this shit out on the fly. Um, but let's get right into it, man. Uh, just absolute ass kicking, fifty six to seven, uh, beat Glen Oak on Friday night. Rob, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, in general, I was a little disappointed. Um, because I expected Glen Oak to be better than that. I thought they were on the way up. I thought they were getting better each year. I thought it would be a closer game, and it wasn't. I mean, kudos to us for going out there and executing. Um, I know we were scoring early and often and making great plays, and that's awesome. I just uh, It's just disappointing to see Glen Oak still down at the bottom when I thought they were on the way up. So. A uh, great win by the Tigers. You know, good teams go out there and do what they're supposed to do to lesser opponents than we did. So we executed well. Uh, really happy with that. Just disappointed that a local opponent that could be, should be a rival, one of the bigger school districts in the area, they're just, uh, they're still struggling. Yeah, I think it was a good wake up call for them. I mean, I know they must have felt pretty good coming off that big win last week against a much lesser opponent. And like we last week on the podcast that when you play those lesser opponents you should kick their ass like that um unfortunately i think we caught glen oak exactly where they are in the picking order compared to us um just i ended up staying on the sideline for the first half uh, after the military thing and it was like blinked and we were up 21 nothing i took a picture of the scoreboard at like seven minutes left in the first quarter uh, we had four first downs, 130 yards, 21 points, less than one minute time of possession, and Glen Oak had negative 13 yards total. It was just like we could do whatever we wanted to him. I mean, like we talked about, you know, you brought it up. How much would we need to run the one or really show a lot with one quarterback and? I don't think he had any rushing attempts on the night. You know, Slaughter goes out there four for six yards or four for six passing, 153 yards, two touchdowns. The one says he can throw two, five for eight, 125 yards, three touchdowns. You know, Slaughter said, "Hey, I can run too," and he had a nice scramble for like 20 some yards. Uh, you know, Peyton Mitchell quietly had a 100 yard rushing game. Uh, you take out his one big run which was like 50-some yards. He still had 11 carries for 75 yards at 6.8 yards pop. Definitely not bad. And there we go. Okay, the highlight of our receiving, you know, leaders, I think is uh, I'm going to give it to the fullback. Two catches, 59 yards, and a touchdown. I don't think we've seen that uh, really since this, you know, offensive system has been implemented here so that was pretty cool to see yeah absolutely i mean the stats kind of very well rounded there as you're going through them um you were kind of breaking up just a little bit hank so i don't know if you need to turn up your pickup just talk a little bit louder it was kind of in and out um, God. but uh uh i i like the fact that we were able to open up the offense um you know kind of balance what we did from week one and then going to week two really opened up and showed that we're not just a one-dimensional team. We have a lot more to offer here than, you know, just running the quarterback the whole time. I remember seeing uh, a post um, or a comment on a Facebook post was from a Glen Oak fan before the game saying all you have to do is stop the QB run and mass on nothing. And, you know, obviously that that's not true. So it's, it's a really good that we're able to go out there and open up the offense and prove that we have a lot more going on. We have a lot of different weapons, a lot of different ways to attack you. And it really makes defense coordinates for the rest of the year have to worry about a lot more. Um, because at any point in time, we can we can mix it up. We can find matchups. You know, that QB run, it's not going away, but we're not dependent on it. So it's just uh, it was a really good showing that we can go out there, we can sling it around and open things up. And I think that's exactly what we needed to do. 
Yeah, so it's good to see the offense show a little bit of versatility, you know, that we're not that one-dimensional offense that some guy that probably doesn't know what he's talking about painted us to be. So talking on the other side of the ball now, you know, the Black Swarm came out and just dominated start to finish. Uh, We held them to 2.7 yards per carry on the ground, 5 for 18 through the air for 77 yards, and I think most of those yards came from one throwback screen that, you know, you miss one tackle and it pops for a big one. Um, we held them to four for 15 on to go opportunities on the night. They were, we held them to 0 for seven on third down in the entire first half. They had 11 possessions, six, three and outs, um, a couple drives with only four plays, one drive with only two plays. And it wasn't until the last two drives they had, you know, against the second and third stringers that they even got anything going. Uh, They managed to get a touchdown on that last one. Good on them for having their starters be able to score against our JV team. Uh, But I do want to give them props on their second to last drive. You know, they they drove it down into the low red zone, looking to score, try and get that goose egg off the board. And it was like fourth and – Fourth down, and they had like 12 yards to go, I think. And it was, do you want to kick the field goal and get the pity points to get that zero off the board? And they didn't. They went for it. They tried to go for it. They tried to get the score, and they didn't. They ended up converting on the next one. But props to them for like not taking the pity points just to get that goose egg off, you know, showing a little bit of still that com- that competitive edge, even at the end of an ass kicking like that, that, hey, if we're going to get points on the board, we're going to get a goddamn touchdown. Yeah, I mean, that's always good to see. There's definitely teams and coaches that will go out there and kick it just so there isn't a few sec. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it shows some grit, and uh, it definitely helps them out long term to go out there and keep competing and not just lay down. So, I mean, good for them for going for it. And, uh, you know, from the top down, they ended up executing at the end. So, uh, good for them. Yeah. Um, I don't really have anything else, you know, on the game. Robbie, got anything else? No, not necessarily. I mean, I think we summed it up pretty well. We did uh, exactly what we needed to do, and Glenna was not up to the task, you know. So I'm just disappointed in them, but really proud of us. And uh, really that's all you can care about right now as a Maslin fan. So we're moving on to the next week. Uh, Real big disappointed but not surprised kind of situation i guess so with that we'll keep moving right on into film room and uh check out some highlights and let's get her going all right first off we got starting quarterback from last friday night dewan owens highlights so let's check it out just a little inverted smash rob what do you think of that play Yeah, I mean, it's a good route, good ball. Um, I was trying to figure out why they had a hard time covering it. But, you know, they, they switched it off early, and that's where you got that, you know, mesh point of the guys passing each other off and letting one run. That safety wasn't in position to cover the flag, and I mean, it ended up working working well. But um, you can see how that linebacker, I'm guessing it's linebacker, rolled down safety maybe. Mm-hmm. Um doesn't pass off his guy really. He kind of gets hung up, doesn't switch. I'm guessing he was supposed to switch there, and uh, we were able to get right past him. But, you know, it's a great play call against that coverage just because how difficult it is for that inside guy to pick it up while looking in the backfield and then run with it to the sideline, and it worked out for a big play. So you're putting that on the apex player, you know, (laughs) Uh, I, 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 I'm coverage. not exactly sure. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how they're supposed to be covering this. I mean, that high safety is not in a position to run with a flag. So I'm guessing that these guys down low are, are supposed to match match coverage this. And it looks like the corner drops off, and that linebacker just doesn't run with the seam. So. Uh, I'm guessing they're supposed to match it, and they didn't. But, you know, that's what happens when you get into these match coverages. If you can find that, you know, mesh point of where they pass off, where they don't pass off, 
and you can exploit it right there. I mean, that's something we talked about last week. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm trying to decipher if this is like kind of a messed up cover three or like a messed up cover four type deal. This is, if it was a cover four, you would want to see that middle field type safety over the number two out there. And if it's a cover three, yeah. then the corner on the outside is just caught with his eyes in the backfield. He sees the guy over him go inside and sees the uh, number two run the flat and just doesn't see the number one break back up vertical and outside. He's So I'm trying to figure out, you know, if that's supposed to be his guy or not. Regardless, yeah, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what they're, what they're running here. I mean, like you said, um, I mean, it could be like a three safety cover three. Um, I mean, it's definitely not like your traditional cover four, that linebacker would be down closer, the safety be over further. Um, they kind of like inverted those guys and, the only thing I can imagine is they're supposed to kind of match this up and then hope the safety can play over top. But yeah, I mean, I mean, when we can't really tell what they're doing, that's, that's tough, but I'm guessing that those two are supposed to, supposed to match this and they don't. And you see the corner even kind of points here. Yeah. Like the switch it off, you know? Um, yeah. yeah that's... <clears throat> Looks like they're supposed to switch or, the corner switched and the other guy didn't. But, you know, that's a great play against that coverage. If you were to just run regular smash out of that, you'd have a much harder time um, with that route combo. But inverting it like this ends up forcing a switch. And when you force guys to switch, you find that they don't always do it correctly. So, Yeah, um, I think we had this play more for <clears throat> last week against Valdosta. I thought it was a lot more of a designer mandator type deal when we ran it. I don't know if we ran it once or twice, but I remember seeing this last week where it's, you still get to the smash concept with the, you know, a guy in the flat and the corner coming over top of it. But again, straight up man, I imagine the number one receiver is supposed to kind of create like a rub on the defender over the number two in the flat and hopefully pop him out free if it's, if it's true man coverage. If it's some kind of you know match zone or just straight drop spot, then you can even see your guy just get confused and don't know who to cover. Yep, what we got here looks like just a little four verts. Uh, hold on. Out of the empty stuff. Yeah, you're just able to get past the safety. I mean, safety doesn't take a great angle on it. Yeah. This look. This looks more like a traditional cover. And when you don't get hands on the number two receiver going vertical or sort of reroute and that safety just has a guy running full speed at him from 10 yards away. It looks like he's got that cushion, but it's still hard to cover a guy like that and do, and do any other job you might have to do, right? Yeah, I mean, the safety has an opportunity to make a play. He just doesn't get there. Outside receiver does a good job of taking the corner with him. Yeah. I mean, I think he knows that the ball is probably not going towards him, so might as well go towards the sideline, take away the coverage from your teammate, right? Yeah, I mean, you're running that into the boundary, um, and the slot receiver does get kind of pushed off of his line a little bit to go outside the linebacker. So it really shortens, you know, how much width you have to deal with the field. So if that receiver, normally we say, you know, like four yards outside the number is a good spot to run your outside fade. 
Mm -hmm. But in this case, he needs to create space for that inside receiver. So he almost gets squeezed all the way to the sideline. And the corner is probably thinking he's doing a great job. But in reality, he's opening up more space for that seam. I mean, it's not necessarily his job to cover the seam. But, you know, if he's facing inwards and the receiver doesn't take a real outside release, then he can get himself into the play. So good job of taking the corner out of the play. And then... A uh, good ball to avoid the safety and a good catch. All right. Interesting to note on this one, it's more or less the same play, almost the exact same field position, just four verts. But the one in there with our regular four wide group, he's got a running back next to him rather than a fullback in front of him. I think you got to see a lot of a lot more of him operating our regular offense rather than just the empty stuff, which is cool to see. All right, next up we got the two's highlights, Jalen Slaughter. Little scramble drill. Makes a pass on the run. Receiver goes up, makes a play. Yeah, it's a great catch. I like this end zone view too, because you get to see, you know, Slaughter, we didn't really use him in the run game, but he's always had good legs on him. He's just always more or less ran and kept his eyes downfield looking to extend the play to throw the ball rather than just tuck it and run it. Ooh. Nice clean pocket. <laughs> For a world, I'm watching the route concept and you're watching the line. I mean, look at the pocket. Let's see here. I mean, phenomenal pocket. It also, like, it must... That DC had to be punching air calling drop eight and have a touchdown thrown over his head. Yeah. I mean, in general, it looks like they've been so far in all the highlights we've watched, they've been dropping a lot of guys. They keep doing that like free safety look. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily here, but <laughs> in the, in the previous ones, they, they had been doing a lot of that like quasi three safety. Not sure what kind of coverage it is, but they keep getting beat over the top. Yeah. That's the fun thing about high school balls. You can know like, all the different coverage rules you you can learn. But some places are just going to run some bastardized shit just specific for a game plan, and you have no idea short of, like, asking the coaches themselves. Here, it looks like our defense. You have the... You have kind of the under front with the backside DN. Jack Backer walked back. Apexing the tackle in the number two. Um, safety's over top of number two. Corners playing off a of one. Yeah, that's... <laughs> they're running our defense, essentially. Except we generally don't let that happen to us. Yeah, I was going to ask if you run. Can you run that back? <clears throat> what are you looking at here? I'm actually going to watch the route combo here, but it looks like the corner, yeah, see the corner jumps that curl, essentially. And, you know, just another one of those weird situations where where do you match? Mm -hmm. And there's just confusion on are we supposed to 
switch guys here or are we locked on? I mean, so one has the corner has one coming vertical at him right away, yep. which is a pretty good indication to match on. But then you have this like wheel behind it, which the safety is still kind of looking in the backfield and he's letting it ride out longer than the corner does. But you would hope that right here, the corner could kind of bail off and pick up on the switch, but every team has different rules. 10 yards down the field, do you switch? I mean, ours was always kind of dependent week by week when we did stuff back when we played. I'd say normally, you know, five to 10 yards is the maximum you'd go. After that point, you're locked on. So that's kind of a tough play because you're putting that safety in a tough spot. He has to get the wheel, but he's also looking in the backfield kind of as run support. So, mm-hmm. um, I so- mean, a lot of things we talked about last week is if you, just, if you just figure out those spots of where players – match or they switch i mean you can you can really mess with them oh yeah so i can tell you that just pure uncut cover four um as soon as the number two goes out then looking to help out on number one uh and when number one goes vertical corner matches on him so you essentially have two guys on one and your apex defender in this case the backside backer walked out as soon as two goes out, he's supposed to match it and should be running with the wheel. Now, with with the wheel route, that does like really mess with a lot of coverages. So you'll have certain game plan specific, uh, you know, adjustments, rule breakers that ideally you would want to see either the corner or the safety break off of number one and run with the wheel. That way, that the apex could just you know run with the wheel up until it gets to the number one sitting there at the curl and hang back, you would ideally get a good trade off there and everybody's still covered. However, uh, that apex doesn't even run with him here. He just kind of passes him off and you got two guys staring at the number one while the wheel just takes off right behind him. So, yeah, I don't know how you can ask that apex defender to do that. I mean, he can play under it, but I don't, see how you could ask him to run with the wheel in that situation. I mean, he's already at a three-yard, four-yard disadvantage, and chances are he's not as fast as the receiver. So, oh yeah. I mean, he could trail it, but I would never expect him to be the main guy covering that. So that's where, like, the wheel route can, you know, kind of break coverages for you a little bit because when two goes out, you're kind of – if you're building a – if you're building a complete – uh, defensive coverage when two is out most of the time it's just a flat route right it's not usually a wheel so you can kind of ask some guys to do their best covering it as well that rule is usually for your sam linebacker or your nickel safety which a lot of these cover four teams are running so if you're asking more of a DB guy to run with, to run with the uh, wheel route, it's a lot easier to ask. But when you just happen to catch them with an outside linebacker slash D end hybrid guy, yeah, that's not something I would want to ask of him. That's something where you need those those rules for the rule breakers of how to pass the stuff off yeah. adequately. There's there's no way there's no way he's covering that. If you're talking about like an out and up, I can understand it. But there's no way. I mean, you're telling me two's going out, but he's really just stemming the one. That's he's not running an out and up. If it's an out and up, I can understand. But there is zero chance that this guy who's looking in the backfield as a run first defender is going to be able to run with that. He's like, that's not out. He's just running vertical a little bit to the left. That's not an out route. I think this it's... guy's still trying to figure out if the running back has the ball or not. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean... There's no way he can run a straight uh, seam. I, there's no way he can cover. Either side, the safety or corner has to go to match that. Yeah, with your backside backer, you're probably not going to expect that of him. I'm just kind of going off the rules for the Sam, which a lot of times when you walk that backside backer off, you kind of just give him the same rules as your Sam, and the coverage becomes mirrored on either side. I don't care if that's a Sam, a nickel, a strong safety. I don't care if it's a corner. 
He's not making that play from that position, Hank. Oh, I'm not saying he's going to. I'm just saying some people will ask that of them. Well, that's a uh, dumb ask. Yes. Full, completely agree. Full stop. <laughs> but I... Th- top of the screen, it looks a lot more like a wheel. Um, the bottom of it, because they're in the boundary here, there's you know less space to work with, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's our, like, I don't know exactly what you want to call it, but split vert snakes with a curl. Yeah, little switch verts. I mean, Ah. you can call it, like, curl, call it curl wheel, but, like, really it's our um, split verts stop. And then you end up getting one guy free that way. I guess so. they run the stop at the top? Yeah. Is it a curl at the top, too? Yeah. Curl wheel rather than switch verts stop because the yeah I mean it, it's essentially the same I mean there's plenty of times where we used to run switch verts and like Austin Kutcher was really good at sitting down if a corner got way too deep and just read this verts in front of him mm-hmm. he could just sit down and it's it's like a curl at that point um, same thing as I think we used to do a, like a stop route on the inside also switch verts and then stop on the which is Kind of similar to this, I guess. The outside guy is going inside for a curl, but yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, somewhere between that and just a curl wheel is is really what we're, what we're looking at here. But the fact that the one doesn't go inwards right away is what keeps the corner locked on him. If they were to just switch immediately, it'd be much easier for that corner safety to pass him off. Yeah, but by having the one go vertical, that's when you get into the weird: are we going to pass him off? Are we not going to pass him off? Situation. Yeah, uh, that's it works. Um, I guess I'd say the only reason I'm not calling this like a switch vert stop like you were talking about is because neither number one really try to get inside to the seams, which would be like the landmark for the number two vertical. They both just stay outside, kind of straight vertical, and both stop. But yeah, getting into semantics there doesn't really matter. What yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a play on a play on a play, depending on what team you're going against, how they're covering it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if they're if they're dropped off like that initially, um, you know, if they're closer together, maybe you do switch. I mean, I don't know. It's just it's kind of a variation of a variation, and it just comes down to how they're covering it. But the play themselves are very similar. It's just where are you attacking that mesh point at? Are you trying to get them to switch early and then outrun them? Are you trying to get them confused 10 yards down the field? Are you going to double up the corner on the outside? So, um, I mean, it's a great play for this situation because you get that corner and safety not on the same page. Correct. Wish you could see up top, see what was happening there. Um, I mean, just like looking at half a freeze frame it looks like they managed to switch it off there to where there is one guy running over the top blurry as hell but i don't see any any uh camo or black behind that white there on the 50 so concepts where it's the quarterbacks just picking a side and you know reading it out from there he's not looking at the other side he's, he's not going from one side to the other it's literally Hey, we're running the same thing on both sides. Pick one side, read it out, and happen to make the right read on this one. And good for six. I think this one's a scramble drill, if I'm not mistaken. Again, DC punching air, just all out pressure. Looked like they had a man come free. And. Slaughter makes a play with his legs. Yeah, it's a great play. I mean, we're able to pick up the blitz pretty decently, so there's not... Slaughter has room to move around, and he finds a hole and exploits it. Okay. 
this is probably my favorite play in the highlight reel. It's uh, really it's just four verts. But you remember last week when we talked about Valdosta running that uh, trap pass, that trap play action, pulling the guard over for the uh, opposite side D end, and you're really you get probably I would say you're going to get absolute worst case scenario where they're actually blitzing the backside backer through that vacated B gap. And you're going to see the running back come up, pick his man up, do a great job at that. And then you see that looks like walk down safety kind of over top of the fullback at about eight, 10 yards there. Uh, He's actually going to step up because he's reading that guard and as he's stepping up because he reads run, fullback just blows right on by him, and we got an easy six points. Yeah, he probably just wasn't expecting the fullback to go out for a route vertically like that. Yeah. It also does help that we almost never run our fullback on a vertical route. It'll definitely catch you off guard. But, yeah, big props to the running back on this one, man. Stepping up, taking on that linebacker, just screaming in there to make a play. Yeah, and receiver was open down the low also. Just beating his man one on one. Woo! But just a great pairing of this is, I mean, more or less exactly what we were talking about last week with uh, you know Tom Brady and Peyton Manning just making a killing with this pass protection. You just you pull that guard, you get a guy in the seam running right behind it where that safety should be. Easy pitch and catch. Yep. All right. Next up, we got Big Mike. <laughs> Here we see him lined up in our heavy personnel. Bouncing a run play. And just grown man strength carrying half the defense in the end zone with him. Yeah, what is Big Mike listed at? 265 or something like that? Um, That's a great question. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. You keep talking. I will do my best. Just almost exact same highlight we watched from, uh, from Pringle last week, honestly, just going opposite side now. Defense f- causes a bounce, run outside, and just carrying dudes into the end zone. Got an answer for us, Rob? Uh, 280. 5'10", 280. 5'10", 280. And that's not like a bad 280 either. That's a very fast, strong 280. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean this in the most absolutely complimentative way. My boy is just a cinder block. Yeah, I mean, that's 280 that he had to, you know, work his way up to. Mm -hmm. You know, he was always a really good athlete. And uh, I think once he started getting meaningful reps on varsity, they kind of had to decide where do we go with this kid? Cause you know, he played running back growing up. He could play everywhere. Really good athlete. He was on the track team um, as a sprinter. And uh, I think it got to the point where it's like, you show promise as this nose tackle defensive tackle. So let's work on getting you up to the right size, you know, cause you're dominant at 225 pounds, 230 pounds. So like imagine what would happen if we get you up to a, actual D1 college sized player. And he's been able to do that while 
maintaining really healthy weight. Just a big, strong kid, um, not putting on weight just for the the sake of it. Like it, it's good weight. So, mm -hmm. but they have listed at two eighty, and the boy can move. He's running the ball. That boy can move. Just look at that get off. I mean, he's a full what yard and a half past the rest <laughs> of. Our defensive line. That's always been one of his strongest points is how quick he can get off. I mean, I remember watching highlights last year, I think earlier in the year, mm -hmm. and he's just like slapping the top of the center's head down because he's already past him before the center stands up. As the ball's he's, going through the center's legs. Yeah, just a quick get off, and he's he's so strong. And, I mean, they have listed at 5'10", so, I mean, he's, he's a stout player, mm -hmm. a lot of leverage. He That's just a pain for opposing centers, and – I mean, this is nothing new. We've been talking about it. Other coaches have been talking about it for years now. So uh, it's just always amazing week in, week out. All right. Last up, uh, we got our man Pringle. I would, you know, like we said before, we're going to be seeing a lot of him on the highlight reels. Just great job working through traffic on the blitz. You know, shoots a gap, gets around yeah, the running back, and he's really good on the blitz. I mean, that's something that we talked about a lot last year, mm -hmm. and I mean, it just continues. He's able to get skinny, find a hole, and running backs are no match for him. He's really good at slapping people's hands down, just get a free release more times than not, and it's just he's so consistent with it. I mean, it's got to be a nightmare. Kind of defend that. Ah, better them than me. Woo! Let's watch that again. What is this? Just good old power? Slips a block and makes a play. Mm hmm. Backside back on power, so you're thinking the strong side, either deuce or tray block. I'm um, just going to come straight back to him. Is that the left guard that he just bounces right off of? Yep. And then bounces off of the backside guard to take on the pulling guard and make the pulling guard tackle the running back. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, here's one of the dumbest rules in football, but it worked out for us. Yeah. Uh -oh. Yeah, I'd rather be on this side of the roll than not, so. Yeah, I mean, saves a touchdown and creates a turnover out of it, so great play. But I think we're all kind of in agreement on that rule. Is not a good one. Yeah, we were talking about it during the game. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure out, like, what the best solution would be. And, I mean, should the ball just go back to where it was fumbled? Yeah, do you want to give and it What to... is the solution to that rule? I don't know because it's, you know, obviously if you can't hold on to the ball, you need to penalize the offense in some way. It's like. Yeah, but if you fumble out of bounds anywhere else, you just, you get the ball where it went out. I think except for, like, on fourth down, you can't fumble forward or something like that. Correct. But, um, I mean, any other time you fumble out of bounds, you just get it back except for when you're down here, and it's a turnover. I mean, I guess give it back to the offense. We're at the spot of the fumble would be, like, the best solution for it. But I mean, either, like, the start of the – well, I, I like spot of fumble. Yeah. But, you know, there's just situations where – I mean, this isn't necessarily one of them because it just seems like a straight-up fumble, but – you know, there's a time where you could be diving for the pylon, you get a hit a yard short, ball comes out, goes to the end zone, and it completely 
changes the course of the game. I mean, I go back to when the Browns lost to the Chiefs in the playoffs, and that was one of the main reasons right there was, you know, you're trying to make a play. You're never really going to fault a player for that, trying to dive and hit the pylon, but you lose the ball out of the end zone, and it's a turnover. And that's just it's, – it's kind of a dumb rule, but, I mean – do you remember if that was on like a fourth down or at the end of a half scenario? I think it was towards the end of the first half. It wasn't the last play of the half. Okay. Good. But it was towards the end of the first half, I think, and Dirty Dan Sorensen, Helmet, Helmet, uh, Hollywood Higgins, and uh, all goes out. So this is actually one thing that's talked about. Um, a fair amount when you're talking about oh what makes you know Bill Belichick such a good coach is one of uh this is one of those like super specific coaching points he has is never reach for the end zone for the pylon for the first down mark or whatever unless it's fourth down or the last play of a half because yeah I mean it makes sense because how many times do you end up fumbling it it happens you reach across the uh, goal line but you don't get there yeah it's so easy. Only just to smack that in your hands. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I get ball security, but at the same time, I, if I remember correctly, this was like a 40, 50 yard play, even long. I mean, and he's scorching down the sideline, just dives for the pylon. I mean, it's a bad rule, it. but I think the game is so tailored to the offense nowadays. I'm fine having like one or two rolls in there that like just really stick it to him. Just to almost try and start to even it out a little bit. Um, it, it's like a it's a bad solution to a problem. I don't know. Like if you could, if you could give me a solid fix to this rule, I'm all ears. But spot of the spot of the fumble going back there just seems kind of ticky tack and giving it back to the offense and not really punishing them for making a bad play. You know what I mean? Yeah, but people fumble out of bounds all the time. And you don't lose the ball when you fumble out of bounds. There's no punishment for that. Yeah, It's but only that's when it's zone. at the end zone. That's what I'm saying. It's only at the end zone. It's, it's, it's a dumb ball. Ball security is job security. <laughs> I don't know how that plays here, but it kind of... Okay, moving on. Kind of an odd, odd play call from inside your own five-yard line. I don't like stretch in short yardage situations unless the defense is like absolutely pinching down and are just begging you to attack the edge which we're really not. Our defense is kind of built on the whole concept of, like, we want you to run left and right rather than forward. So... Yeah, I mean, I don't think they're expecting our linebacker to come downhill that quickly. They brought the crack block in. He misses the first guy, goes after the next one. Can't block him. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to crack... Pringle, you, you better make it worth it. And <laughs> this guy doesn't. So, you know, first guy's downhill right away. Doesn't make the play, but able to bounce it. And Pringle avoids the crack block. I mean, there's some grass there. Pringle gets blocked. Who? But he doesn't. I mean, that's a smooth corner. slip on that crack block, too. Yeah. I mean, corner makes a great play of avoiding his block also. But, I mean, it, it was almost there. I mean, if we're critiquing Glen Oak. I mean, they almost made this work, but you got to get a, a little bit of a block on Pringle, and that receiver has to block the corner. But there's grass there, if not. Just a high, high effort play by Pringle here. I mean,. Great play call, too. Just, uh, that's the thing with play fakes. Every, it seems like the defense just always forgets about the guy that, you know, got the play fake. You do a little play action, they stop looking at the running back. You do a little, uh, fake jet sweep, they stop looking at the receiver. 
So just a little boot throwback screen. Kind of playing against the aggressiveness of our defense and really great play recognition to get back and try and defend the boot, which you'd normally expect to be there. Yeah, I would have liked this first defender to try to force it back inside, but I mean, all in all, we, we got to the ball and kept it from being a 50, 60 yard play. So yeah, can't complain too much. But you end up saving your team, you know, 10 yards if you can force it back inside there rather than letting him, letting him get outside of you. Try to take the path of least resistance. But sometimes you just got to understand your role in that situation. And they got two blockers and I only got one of me. You know, if I can try to split them, set a quasi edge right there, just kind of force it back inside. But, um, you know, he's trying to make a play and, you know, isn't too far off from making it. So, huh? Look like they're going for a little uh oh little quarterback counter on that one. Faking the uh handoff to the right. You bring in the back you bring in the right guard and tackle coming around and quarterback just screws up the mesh. I mean if I saw Pringle just flying downhill in my face, I probably might get a little butterfingery too. Right there, cause a fumble, turnover, Madison's ball. It takes a special kind of grown man to take it up a gap on power into the teeth of the defense and just carry the entire mosh pit another five to eight yards, but... That's why Pringle's a special kind of grown man. Yeah, I mean, it's third and short. You're just trying to ensure that you get the first down, and then you take everything else with it. I like this play. I think it's like just some kind of a, you know, just straight up dive. But the way the defense is lined up, it essentially opens up one of those A-gaps. And you just have Big Mike also running downhill as a lead blocker to where you get him is what essentially turns into your lead block on ISO for Pringle. And by God, is that a scary thought? All right, now moving along into a little bit of a Mansfield Tigers film here. Just a little bit of highlights from their cornerback against Canfield last week. Just kind of get a good look at their defense. So let's go. There's an awful lot of, uh, what would be a good way to put it, other teams' highlights within these guys' own highlight packages. I mean... Yeah, so basically this guy is pretty fast, is what we're supposed to note from this. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's a great play from the opposite side of the field. Yeah. Usually you only ever see plays like this when they are 80, 90 yard runs. Good play by him there. Comes down, kind of sets the edge. Running back still tries to get around it and comes up to make a play. Okay. 
good highlight. <laughs> I mean, he covered the clear out route. Yeah, that ran right at him. Yeah. So good on him, I guess. Getting a little nosy in the run game, just like a little quarterback, probably superpower there. If I'm an OC, that's actually exactly what I want. But good on him coming up, making a tackle. Got anything that's standing out to you, Rep? Not really. I mean, I'm kind of only watching him right now. Mm -hmm. But I mean, he's made a couple tackles. He's obviously fast. It's a pretty decent play on the ball. But... Yeah, I mean, there's only so much to talk about. The corner just being in coverage. Yeah. I mean, nothing's really standing out. It's their defense. Um, it's a very flavor of the week, I think, is the way I heard it put. And you saw they threw a bunch of junk at us last year. You! You! Kind of like this play here. A little rollout, try and hit the tight end leaking out backside. Again, a lot of uh, Mansfield's highlight package here. All right, that's all we got for the corner. Fast, physical, a little nosy in the run game for what little opportunities he got. So let's move right along to their, I think, receiver. Is this number eight? I believe so. I mean, solid read by the quarterback right there. Looks like just uh, kind of your basic stick concept to where really you're only throwing the go ball against certain coverages, and this he's trying to hit the cover two hole between the corner and the safety and just throws up a hope and a prayer. But good on the receiver for making him right. Yeah, so if this is number eight, I mean, it's a guy we've talked about. We talked about him a lot last year. He's a really good player, mm -hmm. great athlete. Um, he's the one that you were supposed to be afraid of last year, but, you know, unfortunately, Mansfield just wasn't able to do anything against us in general. But he himself is a, is a really good player. And it wasn't really for a lack of trying on their part. I mean, I remember them, they moved him all around the field, a lot of uh... – end around motions, jet sweep type stuff, screens. They tried to get the ball in his hands and just couldn't do it. Here, it's inadvisable to just let the slot receiver run a crossing route with no hands on, no bodies in front of him. Try to use him as a distraction. Yeah, they tried the old fake screen. screen and it was covered, but, you know, they're able to still get it to him. This one's rough for uh, Canfield. Is that number eight? Yeah. This is his highlights? Yep. All right, so you're telling me they line him up. Is this like a hands team thing? Yes. They okay. They went for the onside kick. 
I thought they would kind of catch him off guard at first. I thought it was just a normal kickoff, catch him off guard. But, yeah, no. If they're a hands team, yeah, you don't kick it right at him. Woof. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great play if you kick it slow enough that your two gunners can get down there and just absolutely annihilate mm-hmm. the closest returners. <laughs> but um, if the ball gets out in front of them, it's an easy scoop. And, I mean, they, he should still get hit, but <laughs> yeah, um, definitely was not executed correctly. But, yeah, I mean, you can see how athletic this guy is and, you know, they use him everywhere. He plays some defense also. Uh, he's going to be just everywhere on the field for Mansfield offense, defense, special teams, and he's he's a playmaker. Yep. He's the guy. All right. So that's all we got for film room. We'll get out of here, get a little uh, preview of the Mansfield Twigers, and uh, keep her moving, huh? Let's do it. All right, so we got to see a little bit of the Mansfield Twigers. Um, might as well just get into the roster, Rob. Uh, I know you got that from Booster Club. Let's see what we're uh, see what we're going to be going up against Friday night. All right, so I guess we can start with their offensive line. Um, I'll just run through the sizes real quick. Um, from left to right, six four two eighty, six two two fifty, six two three thirty, six one two seventy five. 6'4 to 90. So uh, a pretty decent sized offensive line in general. Um, you know, right around that 270, 275 ish average across the board. Um, they do go senior, senior, junior, sophomore, senior. So they got a couple older players, but they do have a sophomore in there as well. The sophomore is a right guard. Um, so the tackles are probably the strong point of their line. Um, and then their left guard is also pretty decent. Um, coincidentally, those are the three seniors on the line. Usually how that uh, goes. The center's a junior. What's that? Usually how Yes, I mean, the uh, center's a junior. Right guard is a sophomore. And uh, those are probably two of the weaker linemen out of the five. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the seniors are pretty decent players. But... It, it doesn't appear that it's going to be a line that should be giving us too much trouble as a group. So, um, I, I, if you haven't tell, if you didn't tell from the highlights or kind of just paying attention, I mean, Mansfield is not the toughest team on our on our schedule this year. Um, doesn't mean that it won't be a game at all. Um, you know, after coming after Glen Oak last week, it's you never know what you're going to get. But uh, they have a pretty decent sized line, but. I wouldn't expect them to just come out and absolutely pound it on us. I uh, know uh, they, they couldn't do that last year, and uh, our defense yeah, has really I, only gotten better. So, <clears throat> good luck. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly how to compare them this year to last year. I haven't watched that much of them, but last year it felt like was their year. They had hype going into the game. They were doing well down there. Um, some of the media, or at least – local media to them were hyping them up, talking about the quarterback being being a dude. Um, obviously, that number eight we were talking about, um, his name is Amar Davis. I mean, he's a dude, and, and would, he is. But I think there was a lot of hype with them last year, and you know they scheduled us last year for a reason. I think that was their shot. I'm not saying that they lost a whole lot this year, that they're, they're down compared to last year, but I think you know what you saw last year is – probably pretty similar to what you're going to get this year. Maybe they're a little bit more prepared for us specifically. Maybe they learned that they can't just throw junk at us and it's going to work. So maybe they're a little bit more well-rounded against us this year, but talent wise, I, I wouldn't say that there's a huge gap from year to year. So a uh, quarterback, uh, the same one that was their quarterback last year, Duke Reese, 6'4", 205, is a senior now. He was the one that they tried hyping up last year. And then I think ever since the Massel game, that hype train kind of went downhill. Uh, we proved that he wasn't, you know, the amazing talent that they may have thought he was last year. So um, they also used a different quarterback last week against Canfield. So uh, I'm not sure if it's injury-related, scheme-related, talent. Uh, but, I mean, I would, I would expect the, the senior, the same one we saw last year, to be, uh, be that starting quarterback for us. He, he's athletic, but he's, he's not the best thrower in the world. 
Um, it's going to be kind of a common theme across the board with them. They, they have some talent, they have some athleticism, but none of them are just super well-rounded players across the board. So uh, running backs, 5'9", 190, 5'10", 220. Um, and then when it comes to skill guys, a lot of their skill guys, well, actually a lot of their players in general go both ways. So uh, it might be more apparent with their skill guys. Um, but we, we talked about number eight, Mar Davis, six foot 175, and he's he's a good player. We saw how flashy and athletic he is. He can make big plays. He goes both ways, um, but he, he's their star player. I mean, with that, they also have a couple other receivers they use, six foot 185, six foot 175. Um, but, you know, not a whole lot to write home about with them. You know, it's kind of just what we saw is what you get. You got, you got some athletes out there, but. You know, number eight is, is what the offense runs around. Um, they use a tight end. Uh, he's 6'5", 235, pretty good-sized kid. Um, but, you know, not a, not a dominant player out there for him. He also goes both ways. Um, so that is their offense. I mean, I don't know if there was anything in general that you noticed from between last year and the film that you watched this year, Hank, that you might want to touch on um, about them scheme-wise or talent-wise. Not really that we haven't already said uh, the offense tends to run through number eight as it should. He's their best player on the field, and it would be a disservice to not try and find ways to get him to touch the ball as much as possible. Uh, I think what we saw last year against us was a team that kind of knew it was going in a bit over its head, a little overmatched, and they – Props to them. They did their damnedest to try and get their guy the football. We were just that much better than, you know, that much better than them overall. And they didn't have anybody else that could really step up and take advantage of all their of all of our defense's eyes being on number eight. I think if they want any hope and a prayer in this one, then that's they're going to have to find somebody else to be able to make a play besides number eight because that's who our defense is going to be keying on. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's important to notice from last year was that I think the game was actually closer than what the score said, mm -hmm. uh, especially early on. I mean, it, it wasn't just a dominant feat from us. You know, I think we came out a little bit slow, if I remember, and their offense was, you know, they were they were eating up clock. They just couldn't, you know, get the big first downs on us. They couldn't score on us, but. I mean, it was kind of a battle there in the beginning, but just ultimately every time they needed a play, they couldn't get it against us. So, uh, I mean, props to the defense last year for being able to do that. But, you know, just to remind everybody that it, it wasn't just a complete blowout. We didn't go out there and score 21 points the first eight seconds like we did against Mono last week. So, I mean, the team was decent. They just – every time you needed a break, every time you needed a first down, you needed the ball to bounce your way, Mansfield didn't get any of them. So – um, it, it should be slightly tougher competition than, you know, what Glennon was able to put up last week. At least I would expect that from them. Mm -hmm. Um, they're coming to us this year, so I'm sure they remember it from last year. And, you know, a lot of their main players are coming back. So they have some experience and hopefully coming to Paul Brown Tiger Stadium is, is going to get them hyped up enough that they, they can, uh, they can try their best and give us a game. I mean, is there anybody on the defensive side of note? Because I have a you know a few thoughts on those two, but I'll let you on their defense overall. But if there's anyone you want to point out on that side of the ball, I'll let you do that first. Yeah, so at least from what we're seeing here is that they do multiple schemes on defense. And with that, they move some of their players around. Like I mentioned, they got players that go both ways. Um, notably, they have... On the defensive line, they go 6'2", 250, 6'1", 240, 6'2", 225. Not a huge line there. But then they also have, you know, based on scheme, and they have two other guys, 6'1", 270, 6'1", 275. So uh, one of their defensive ends, Carmelo Smith, he is also the left guard. But – He's listed at 6'2", 250, but he's a the guy they move around. They will also play him at linebacker, depending on what front they are running. So uh, apparently he's a, he's a pretty athletic, aggressive downhill player, and he's able to play linebacker. I mean, 
having a left guard that can play Mike isn't a, yeah. a real common thing that you see, but I think they're able to move guys around and try to take advantage of, you know, where they can put players. And uh, at the same time, they might be fairly dependent on their starting group of players to go both ways and they need them to move around. So I'm guessing they probably don't have a whole lot of depth. Yeah, having a guy on your roster who's left guard slash DN slash Mike is definitely uh, it's one of those unicorns out there. You don't really see much at all. Um, but, yeah, to that point about them being multiple, they threw out some junk at us last year. You know, they came out the first snap. If you want to go back and watch it on uh, YouTube where we came out tight end one side and three receivers to the other. And they had, I think, a three tech, a five tech, and like a wide seven tech outside, um, opposite the tight end, and that just ensured that they had a free rush backside every time. And I think that's why you saw for most of the game, we came out and had a tight end one side, fullback on the other, to really widen those edges out, make sure we had enough dudes that you know we could block up all those bodies that they were trying to overload on one side, and. We just warmed down. You know, I think we've seen a lot of zone running from us in that game. Just a lot of, you know, we're power against different fronts. It can get pretty funky. Guys can get lost in the wash in some spots against certain defenses, especially something like that. So you go to a more zone running. It just allows you to pick up those junk defenses a little bit easier. And when you have a dude like Trell carrying the rock against that stuff, um, you know, it's just easy for him. Uh, I think you're probably going to see a very similar start from us uh, come out a little bit slower, a little more tentative, just because knowing that they're going to come out with something that we can't necessarily prepare for, it's going to be tailored specifically to us, that it's going to take a little while to figure that out. You know, when a team comes out with a much more standard defense, when you know what they're going to do, you can be a little more when you have no idea what a defense is going to do to you, then you're going to have to spend those first couple drives throwing everything you can out there, formationally, personnel, motion, shift, all that kind of stuff, to see how they're matching you up while not necessarily being the most aggressive in that. It's a, it's a lot of fact-finding. It's a lot of uh, just a lot of little body blows. It's like watching... It'd be a lot like watching, um, you know, a boxing match or UFC fight where the first round is they're just kind of like, you know, jabbing a little bit, seeing the space, seeing uh, just lots of lots of poking and prodding, seeing what they're doing. And then you're going to see us either just wear them down or maybe see what we've seen the last couple weeks and uh, start attacking them a little more aggressively than I think we're used to seeing. So that's kind of my impression of their defense and how we're going to attack that. Uh, Rob, you got anything else to add? No, not, not a whole lot. I, I think that's a pretty good synopsis because <clears throat> just because how they came out so funky last year, we're, we're going to have to see what they're going to do. And I definitely think that we're a good enough team that we can uh, go a couple rounds with them early, a couple drives to figure them out and hold them off. And then we can move on with what we know is going to work. So, I wouldn't be surprised if we do that. Um, at the same time, I think we're also a good enough team that we could probably do that and still move the ball and score. So um, if we come out slow, that's probably why. If we come out and we score a lot early, we're probably still moving guys around and figuring out what they're doing to us. We just happen to be executing at the same time. So um, I wouldn't be surprised either way. But if we're getting close to halftime and we haven't – started gaining real good success on offense, then I'd be kind of surprised. But that first quarter, like Hank said, we might just be feeling it out. So um, we got two fan questions. All uh, right, let's hear them. We want to like jump through those real quick. I know um, you're a then, busy man. You got to get going, you know. Uh, people to see, things to do, and all that fun stuff, right? Yeah, I do. I, yeah, I got an appointment I got to get to. But um, here's our two questions, one of which I just replied to in the DMs because I didn't really think of it as being a podcast question, just a regular question that I feel like answering. 
but we're going to put it on, on the podcast real quick. So uh, the question is, do you have any insight on why we don't try to block more punts? It seems like both games, there have been a lot of high and shaky snaps, and it seems like even if we get a decent return, there seems to be a flag on them. More pressure on the punter seems like a good way to apply more heat on those shaky snaps. And uh, I'm not going to read what my exact reply was, but you know, Hank, you can chime in here as well. Basically, what I told him was, at least from my experience when we played, punt blocks were very um, specifically designed for the exact team we're playing that week. Everybody runs their punt a little bit different. Every team has a weaker spot somewhere along their unit. And we would always draw up a punt block exactly for the team we were playing, more or less. So there's a chance that if we didn't know ahead of time that this team was going to have slow snaps, we might not have really repped too much punt block that week. So it might just not really be in the play call. Not that we can't just run a generic punt block, but usually the design specifically for the team, we're trying to get a two-on-one against somebody somewhere open up. I also said that there are plenty of times in a game where it is better to play it safe and try to defend against a potential fake while also making sure you don't hit the kicker and just give them an easy first down. So sometimes getting no punt return, but you get the ball is still a good play. So uh, I think that's two reasons. I, I finished it with based on, our current coaching staff and the experience that we've had, um, I would expect us to start going after kicks against the teams that we think we can block. I mean, we've shown that over the last 10 years that we, we will go after kicks and we'll get them. But at the same time, you're not going to devote a whole week's worth of punt block practice time against a team that has a good snap, good kick. So when the time comes and we have a team we think we can block, I think we will go after it. But anything to that, Hank? So, yeah, just to kind of add to your point, um, I think punt team, especially punt block is or punt return, is probably one of the most sing singularly game-planned elements in football. Um, it, like, super drawn up. You don't really just have, you know, like a – you're not really going to call just a basic punt block that's probably applicable to any team. You're going to be super, super specific to that team. Uh, and with that, you know, we've seen in the past, we've talked to the coaches. I remember they talked about, I can't remember if this was on the podcast or off, but back in 2018, where about halfway through the year, we went to a very aggressive, we're just going to try and block every punt because we weren't getting punts that were had enough hang time to set up the return so another element of that is we might be getting good kicks from these kids that we think we can set up the return on and like you said take that safer route to making a big play whereas you know blocking the punts a big play there's always that other element of being too aggressive you hit the punter you give them you know 15 yards probably a first down when you're setting up that return you're it's you're less inclined to have a penalty to bring it back to give them a first down, something like that. So I think we've expected to be able to set up returns on these guys and get the big play uh, that way. You can especially see when you're running two returners on punt team, you're losing an extra guy on the line. You're not going to be able to, you know, get that free rusher as easy to be able to block the punt in the first place. So I think if we go in, we see a team that – either doesn't really have a great punter or that we think we can get that punt block on them. We might see that in the future. It's just not been in the game plan for the last couple of weeks. Yep. I agree. So uh, here's our second question. It just came in a couple minutes ago. And um, after that, I, I wrote that I get going, but should the team continue with a two quarterback system commit to one for the rest of the year or run a similar system to what we have with Slaughter and Nicole Elroy in 21. Uh, I think my answer to that is that we'll continue with the two quarterback system and do it game by game, um, feel it out how it's working. Cause I think it is important right now 
to, to use both and it's, it's working. Now, when we get into a tight game, that doesn't mean that we will go with one or the other more than the other. But I think, uh, especially this week, we will still continue to use two. And it, it does make us more dangerous because whereas both quarterbacks can do very similar things, they also have strengths that the other ones don't. So I think it just keeps the defense more honest if we're able to prove both guys can do multiple things. And um, But once we get into a tight game, a big game, I wouldn't be surprised if we, we try to stick with the one that we think fits that game better. Yeah, I'll keep my answer short and sweet for you. Um, I think, yeah, I like having the two quarterbacks um, that, you know, the old adage of, oh, if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have one. I think the performance in the last couple games really begs to differ. They've both done a good job. You know, Slaughter might have looked a little more off in, against Valdosta, but re-watching some of the highlights, we didn't necessarily point out that – there was some other stuff going wrong in the offense that just didn't help his performance. A lot of that stuff wasn't necessarily on him. Um, having both quarterbacks with two different kind of skill sets like that really makes it difficult for a defense to prepare for. Uh, the other side of that coin is we've talked about it before. Receivers in a rhythm with their quarterback. Um, that can kind of you know throw them for a loop. It can be a little more rough around the edges in that regard if you keep switching guys out and trying to run the same stuff but hey that's ball they're still practicing with both of these guys all week every week um i think if we're gonna settle with one quarterback and stick with that uh it's either one guy's gonna have to get hurt or one of the guys is going to force them to make a decision. You know, you're either going to see DeWan come out and start slanging that rock better than Slaughter can, or you're going to see a better runner than DeWan. One of those, th- or one of them is going to have to have, like, continuously really bad performance. One of those guys is going to have to force the coaching staff to make a decision because right now, they're both working and there's really no downside to moving away from it at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just important that, you know, if we're going to use both of them and they're both working, then, you know, we stick with it. You never know when somebody's going to get a little banged up. You never know when somebody's going to have the flu on a Thursday and, you know, you've been practicing the other guy all week. So at the current time both quarterbacks are working and i think we can go either direction so because of that i think we'll continue to use both but i mean like you just said and i was kind of alluding to it doesn't mean that we can't move away and get to one guy later in the year but right now there's no reason to it's working and um you're keeping guys fresh you're keeping the competition alive and you know it's working so let's wait until it's not working and then come back to it um, yeah, I mean, right now, neither one has fully separated themselves to the point where they should just absolutely be the number one guy. And I don't think they have an issue with it either. So let's write it out and see what happens. Yep. Um, I know you got to get out of here, Rob. So with that, let's uh, go Tigers. Beat the Twigers. Go Tigers. <laughs>